Um, th these are not as uncommon as you might think, um, but it's still a very limited environment. Just to complete the, uh, re the reimbursement uh, uh, issues, neurologic only for now pre-surgical evaluation for seizures. For seizures. Uh, Alzheimer's is being resubmitted. It was denied initially. Um, they're trying to, to tweak the language, and uh, hopefully that'll be listed in the not too distant future. Cardiac actually is, very, is fairly well reimbursed um, for both viability and perfusion. So um, that has actually more flexibility than the others. Remember, these are all for Medicare. Now, uh, PET can be useful for other primaries, um, gyne tumors, cervical and ovarian, uh, pancreatics, renal cells, sarcomas, testiculars. Um, and some of these may be added to the list of Medicare approved in the not too distant future. Um, for now, if the patient has private insurance, um, you can occasionally, you can, you can often do it. Um, imperative, you get pre-approval um, from your insurance company. It's not like doing a CAT scan where, you know, if you don't get reimbursed, what did you really lose? A couple minutes of CAT scanner time. Um, for these patients, we have to order a dose. It's expensive, 500 bucks a pop or more. Um, and they only have a two-hour half-life. You have to throw them away. Um, so you basically, you, you, you've eaten. Um, you're losing money if you're not getting reimbursed. So it's very important. PET isn't great for everything. Um, probably one of the biggest disappointments with FDG PET is prostate cancer. As you know, these cancers are often lower grade, more indolent. More indolent. You die with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer. Um, and they're not often very FDG avid. Furthermore, you know, these recurrences in the prostate bed are, ma are obscured by normal bladder activity. So um, people are working on some other agents. Some of the C11 compounds, such as acetate and uh, choline have lots of promise. There's the thought is that they'll have a, an agent besides FDG for prostate staging for PET restaging. Hepatocellular, not great. Liver metastasis, though, very good. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors, these are often, again, lower grade. We're still going to be stuck with our um, Octrea scans, our MIBG scans. Multiple, multiple myeloma, unfortunately, not great. Um, Malt tumors specifically and leukemias are also nothing you'd really want to do PET scanning for. Okay, um, the recurring theme you're gonna we're gonna we're gonna encounter as we go through these cases are that PET is and I'll just emphasize again excellent in the staging and restaging and occasionally diagnosis and occasionally response to therapy a number of tumors. You add PET to your imaging proto imaging protocol and you will, you will significantly increase the sensitivity and specificity resulting in more accurate staging compared with CT alone. Uh, and in, general, and in general, it will result in an upstaging or downstaging a significant portion of your patients. Really been an eye-opening experience based compared to, the, to CT alone. <clears throat> okay, now why is that? Well, PET, just like other nuclear medicine tests, images function, in this case glucose metabolism, CT and MR, by and large, is imaging structure. And the structural-based size, shape, and density criteria that CT uses, you know, greater than a centimeter in short axis, well, that's just an educated guess. It's based on statistical data. However, it's certainly just a statistical guess. PET will directly assess these areas. Another, another reason PET works so well is while it has poor resolution, it really has a higher contrast of tumor to background ratio. So the lesions just light up, they jump out at you. Whereas on CT, they can be hiding in, um, in loops of bowel or in part of the bone you didn't look at. Um, pet, you know, you're much less lesions that are just truly missed, okay? A pet will upstage your lesion, your, your patients, because it'll find those little bits of tumor that were invisible, overlooked, or misinterpreted on CT. And it can downstage your patient. It can redefine as benign all or a portion of a structural abnormality, which CT classified as malignant. So residual tissue is a scar that they thought was tumor. Um, enlarged lymph node, which is just reactive but not malignant. Uh, collapsed lung distal to an obstructing tumor, which they call chest wall involvement. Um, PET can tell you that, nope, that's not tumor, that's all benign. So basically, PET finds more tumor, but it yet more accurately, we'll find less tumor. We'll go through some numbers as we go along. This is one uh, nice example for breast cancer. A study from a couple of years ago looked at um, adding PET to the protocol and resulted in a change in clinical stage in over a third of the patients, um, usually upstaged, but 
one out of four of these, or one out of three and a half, were actually downstage. And even if the, ch the stage didn't change, it resulted in a change in clinical management of half to two thirds of the patients um, by increasing the size or decreasing the size of the radiation port, for instance. Okay, so diagnosis, staging, restaging, response to therapy. Let's talk about diagnosis first. As I mentioned, the, early, the most common um, diagnostic use of PET is going to be for solitary pulmonary nodule, evaluate for malignancy, but it will also be used occasionally for guiding biopsy, the best place to put the needle uh, in the malignant part of the mass, uh, evaluating an unknown primary, um, and this happens not uh, uncommonly. Surprised, surprised primary. Okay, solitary pulmonary nodule. Historically, um, how do you get at these? These coin lesions on CT, um, less than four centimeters, that's how they've been categorized. Um, well, there's transbronchoscopic biopsy, but the sensitivity isn't that great, particularly for uh, more peripheral lesions. So CT-guided biopsy, much better. Uh, however, you know, these are so somewhat invasive. They hurt, you bleed, you get pneumothoraces, you need chest tubes, they're expensive. You can kill people. Uh, I've done it. Um, the uh, PET can be considered a metabolic biopsy. Um, similar sensitivity and specificity. It's not invasive, and it saves many unnecessary surgeries. And probably this last region reason is um, saves bucks is why this became one of the very earliest Medicare-approved indications because it saved the government lots of money. Okay, let me digress just for a second because when we talk about nodules and measurements, standardized uptake value comes into play. What is it? Um, it is a semi-quantitative measurement like the Hounsfield units. Basically, you imagine the injected dose normalized to patient body weight, allowed for decay, distributes uniformly throughout the patient. And that's given an arbitrary value of one. Just like water is given arbitrary value, the Hounsfield units of zero, the average uptake is considered to be one. Therefore, any focal region um, that you draw a region of interest around can be expressed as a ratio of that increased or decreased to the average. And the common cutoff for malignancy is 2.5. Now, people kind of fall in love with these numbers and what's the SUV. I don't like the SUV all that much. Um, it um, can be affected. It's not, it's not a perfect number. It's affected by the patient's weight. Uh, the size of the lesion, partial volume effects, patient's blood sugar, uh, the time post-injection to imaging of uptake, these will all alter your SUV. Um, and so visually, and study after study will show that the visual impression um, is often as good, if not better, than SUV. In other words, if a focus is hotter than the blood pool, if it's hotter than blood pool, it is considered abnormally increased and therefore possibly malignant. If it's blood pool or less, it's benign. And I like that for most things. Now, one area where the SUV would be particularly useful is looking for response to therapy. And there, you'd want to see, is the SUV decreasing? But you need to be careful that all these other parameters have stayed the same on the same patient. So here's our standard indeterminate solitary pulmonary nodule. It's a couple centimeters. It's not spiculated, but it's not really benignly calcified either. Um, basically, one, two, three, four, five, is this a bronchogenic lung cancer or is this a benign granuloma? There are other things you need to know, rheumatoid nodules, a AVMs, solitary, solitary metastases. But by and large, is this lung cancer or is it a benign granuloma? And you can see this is the lesion, and it's hotter than blood pool. It's in the malignant range. Now you can calculate the SUV, 7.5, clearly in the malignant range. Um, this is cancer until proven otherwise, and it's hi highly specifically, uh, almost certainly cancer. You need to get a, a tissue sample um, or just resect it. Now, in addition to doing a metabolic biopsy of this lesion, we've also staged the patient. Okay, um, look carefully in the left hilum, and even though on the CT there's only, you know, two millimeters of tissue there that no one would even look at, let alone mention, um, this is hypermetabolic too, and this is the proper uh, drainage pattern, um, so this is a left hilar metastasis. Now, the hilar uptake is not as specific as the parenchymal uptake, and therefore, um, these thoracic surgeons, rightly so, don't 
trust pet 100% um, if it's positive. If, if the pet is negative, they'll go ahead and operate. If there is an ipsilateral node, they'll go ahead and operate. They're always going to sample the nodes, at least during the surgery. If pet shows contralateral nodes, um, as we'll see later, uh, uh, some false positives, then they will generally do a mediastinoscopy and see if it's truly metastatic and inoperable or is it a false positive. Here's another solitary nodule, much larger, uh, but again, not speculated, but not calcified. This is cancer, isn't it? And here, there's just some vague activity. It's no hotter than the blood pool. It's in the benign range. You can calculate the SUV. It's 2.0. Uh, you don't have to biopsy this. Um, when a lesion gets to be much larger than this, or a little bit larger than this, then it's kind of all bets are off. But um, basically, a benign solitary pulmonary nodule by PET can be observed. I wouldn't forget about it 100% because you can have false negatives, low-grade tumors such as bronchioveolar cancer, carcinoids can occasionally be false negative on PET. But you can now treat this as you would any other indeterminate lesion on CT, document two-year stability, and that's fine. You'll almost generally always be right. Um, if this was hot, you'd have to get tissue. Okay. Um, this is a patient that came to us recently um, and has this ugly-looking left hilar mass. Um, patient uh, went to Bronx. They went right to Bronx before they even came to us. Um, but the Bronx came back, they biopsied, and they came back as benign. Well, they didn't like that. The patient has a pleural effusion, they had some weight loss, um, there was a uh, smoking history. So they came, to, they came to us and we got a PET scan. You can see this lesion is clearly hot, definitely in the malignant range. Well, um, let's look a little bit more carefully at it. There's something going on down here too, we'll come back to that. Okay. And uh, I went over the case with the, uh, the pulmonologist and I said, um, well, there's the mass, and there is the tumor, there is the FDG superimposed there. I said, by the way, did, what, what part did you biopsy? They said, oh, we went to the upper lobe and we put the needle through there. So they, they actually biopsied this part of it. Well, this is not the malignant part of the tumor. Uh, this is either collapsed lung or reactive lymph node, but not malignant. I said, you know, get back in there and put the needle down there. And they did, and it's it was a lung cancer. Um, and so this is a case where PET can help guide the biopsy and make the diagnosis. Now, I also said, by the way, you probably want to put a finger up the rectum, and there's almost certainly going to be a rectal cancer there as well. So this is one of those rectal or colorectal surprises. This was another interesting case. The patient had these two kind of, it was better on the infused CT, but here on non-infused you can see these two mass-like regions in the right lung, um, one anterior, one, pot, one posteriorly in, a, in effusion. They simply tapped the effusion. It came back as equivocal, not definitely positive, um, and they really weren't sure what to make of it. Um, and they wanted to know, well, can we biopsy this or what should we do? Um, we got a PET scan. And you can see, well, that's hot, but again, it's the anterior portion which is hot. This thing was not, so tell them, put a needle in this thing. And this turned out to be mesothelioma. Um, now I also told them, this is the f next day from that other case, another example of my favorite dish, uh, colon surprise. It happens. Uh, no one had picked up on the fact that uh, this patient had some blood in their rectum. They did afterwards, but I said, that's almost certainly going to be a colon cancer. And they scoped them, and it was. So um, two primaries in this case, making the diagnosis on PET. Uh, this was a patient who had a history of ovarian cancer, had some adenopathy on physical exam in the pelvis, and they wanted to know the restaging. Well, you can see these nodes here, certainly malignant. Uh, recurrent ovarian cancer, but look at the right breast. There's this focus very, very hot here, um, which in retrospect on CT, you could say, yeah, you know what, there is kind of a nodule there. I said, time for mammography and biopsy. I said, even if the mammogram was negative, I'd then go to an MRI, because while this is not 100% sp specific for cancer, adenomas can occasionally be very hot. Um, it's cancer until proven otherwise, and another primary diagnosis. This patient, I think, had a pulmonary nodule they were staging. There was a smoker. And the good news for this patient was that the lungs were clean. There was just a little granuloma. However, diagnosis of a right um, 
laryngeal cancer, um, and the right vocal cord, which, uh, again, this is one of those surprises that happens. These patients tend to have, you know, I won't say bad genes, but they, they're, 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 their cells are more prone to cancer um, in a number of, uh, a number of ways. Um, people, bring, people then ask the question, and you may be thinking, well, how small a lesion can I detect? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on the location of the lesion, what its, neighbor, what its environment is, what its neighborhood is. If it's sitting in the lung surrounded by air, then it's easier to detect and easier to see increased activity. Uh, it depends on location. It depends on uptake. So as I said before, those lesions which are very metabolically aggressive, um, you can see smaller. Those cancers that are more indolent and only mildly increased, then you can't see them very well. Um, but if you think about it, what you're really asking by this question is not how small a cancer can I detect, but how small a lesion can I confidently call benign? Because remember, if it's hot, it's hot. If it's two millimeters and it's hot on PET, then it's cancer until proven otherwise. You don't have to say, well, it's too small. What you're really asking is, how small can I call something benign if I don't see it on PET? And that's a difficult question, and it depends on the quality of the scan, the quality of the scanner, um, the location, and uh, it's still controversial. A lot of people will say about a, a centimeter for a lung lesion, uh, a good quality scanner, a good quality scan. Um, you may, you may actually be able to see things around seven or eight millimeters. Um, if it's cold, to say, okay, I'm confident that that's in the benign range. If it's smaller than that, though, five millimeters or less, I don't trust a negative PET um, because it just doesn't have that resolution, although it's getting better. PET machines are, are getting more and more. Uh, crystal size are getting smaller. Resolution is increasing. Okay, next area, and this is, again, probably the most common use of PET, and that is staging and restaging cancers. Um, We'll talk about different cancers, but um, some of the earliest work and one of the first approved indications was for lung cancer staging. Um, CT and MR, uh, historically, were perf are performed really more CT, but um, how do they stage the mediastinum? Size criteria of a lymph node. If it's smaller than a centimeter, it's considered benign. If it's larger, it's considered malignant. Well, of course, you can have small metastases to a lymph node before it grows. Cer and you can also have lymph nodes greater than a centimeter just be reactive. So not surprisingly, you know, we, we go along dictating not pathologically enlarged, and really we're not right all that often. Uh, we're, not, we're not right as often as we think we are. What I found even more surprising, though, was that the specificity isn't even that great. So a lymph node that's two or three centimeters is not always going to be malignant. So, you know, again, statistical guesses, PET will directly assess these areas, having a much higher sensitivity and specificity. <clears throat> um, in the thorax um, and for distant metastases. How often do you see an adrenal lesion on a PET scan, or on a CT scan rather? Um, in lung cancer patients, adrenal adenoma versus metastases. So here's our paramediastinal bilobed lung cancer. Um, and on CT, there's some schmutz at the right lung base. Is this volume averaging with the liver? Is this scarring? Is this atelectasis? Or is this intrapulmonary metastasis? Hard to really say with any confidence. How about further down, right adrenal lesion? Is this an adenoma or is it a MET? Really could be easily either, just based on the CT. Well, in PET, we don't have to wonder. Uh, here's our primary lesion. Um, here's the adrenal lesion. It's hot. If it's hot, it's almost certainly going to be a metastasis. And here, here it is here. How about that lung-based lesion? It's not volume averaging. It's not atelectasis. It's not scarring. That's an intrapulmonary metastasis. Here's the whole body lymphoma evaluation. Look how easily you can evaluate lymphoma, neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, you can imagine how easy it would be to follow up these patients instead of going through all the measurements one by one on CT. You can get a, a very broad and rapid overview of the whole body. Um, this is Hodgkin's disease. Now, I point your attention to the supraclavicular region. The more PET I read, the more of a paranoid CT reader I am because I realize it's not all that amazing, although it's not bad, um, but there's a couple particular blind spots, and one of them is the supraclavicular region. Um, you know, it's often the very first slice. You have beam hardening artifact. You have contrast from, from the contrast in the bone. You have muscle and vessel running through here. Um, very hard to, I find very often we are undercalling our supraclavicular lymph nodes. 
Another case of lymphoma and another blind spot is the porticaval region. We have uh, duodenum, papillary process of the liver, portal vessels, uh, on a, other unopacified bowel. Another area which CTI find really undercalls tumor as opposed to the PET scan where it just jumps out at you. Uh, another case of lymphoma on CT, the spleen was just enlarged but no focal lesion. Here you can see it's just packed with tumor in addition to tumor above the diaphragm. Melanoma, very well seen on PET. Uh, patient had a left thigh lesion. CT had some enlarged nodes on the left, five millimeter nodes on the right, not pathologically enlarged, and a nodule in the right lung. This is a net. This is a granuloma. Really hard to tell. Well, these left-sided nodes were obviously hot, but those five millimeter nodes on the right, those are also malignant, and this nodule is also a pulmonary metastasis. Thyroid cancer, um, we talked about the limited indications. Um, here we have an I-131 scan um, with some recurrence in the neck and in the lungs. Um, ordinarily, we, we would have to stop here. This was for a study. We got a PET scan, and we can see now lots of uh, the same distribution in the neck. You see the resolution even better in the lungs, many more lesions. Didn't make a difference here, uh, although this could de-differentiate and become no longer I-131 AVID. In that case, the PET scan would still be positive and would be very useful. Okay, uh, this is a case of another case of melanoma. Only thing on CT was this thing in the spleen. Are you going to call this definitely inoperable metastatic disease, or could this be some kind of a weird cyst? Well, on PET, it's a metastasis for sure. Um, that kidney's male rotated as well. This patient had a difficulty swallowing, somehow bypassed endo and made it directly to um, radiology, and we got a double contrast esophag esophagram, and you can see this, uh, this mid-esophageal lesion. It was then biopsy, and it was positive for uh, carcinoma. CT was negative, and PET was performed. Here is the esophageal primary, but here's our friend, Mr. Superclavicular Lymph Node. Even in retrospect, you're not going to call that uh, on the CT, and I'll show it to you. Um, one caution for PET of esophageal cancer, um, the lesion is often so intense that even um, though you don't see anything around it, you can't exclude periesophageal uh, lymph node metastasis, although the surgeons don't really care. They remove that all and block. But I mentioned that, that we cannot completely exclude periesophageal metastasis here. Here is the supraclavicular region. You just, you just wouldn't call that. Okay, uh, this is the patient who had stool parectum, uh, did go right to endo, and they got the scope around the hepatic flexure, and they saw this constricting lesion. They biopsied it, had no carcinoma of the colon, could not get the scope around any further, went to CAT scan, that was negative, went to PET scan, and here's the lesion. But hello, there's a, a larger synchronous lesion at the, base of the sink, at the base of the cecum. This would have been a complete surprise in the OR, and we were able to spare our surgeons uh, the surprise. They don't like surprises. Uh, this was another lesion we saw in PET in the hepatic flexure. Um, they scoped them. It turned out this was just a villus adenoma. This was not malignant yet, uh, although I would not want this lurking around my colon for very long. Uh, they removed that. Uh, liver metastases, very well seen on PET. Um, here the infused CT just showed a single lesion. Um, PET, we see a small satellite lesion here. A number of studies, it's controversial, but a number of studies looking at MR and CT and PET for liver metastases um, has deemed uh, the PET the most accurate, um, although other studies have other results. Very good for liver metastases, though. Another case of colon cancer. Um, ugly looking lung lesion on this patient. Um, they wanted to know, is this, is this a recurrence? Um, not your typical metastasis. Well, on PET, the lungs are actually unremarkable. There's only very uh, minimally increased activity, less than blood pool. Um, that was the good news. The bad news is there are two left inguinal metastases, which, you know, the lymph nodes are smaller than a centimeter. This one was about seven millimeters, and this one you won't even, just can't even see but this makes much more sense as far as the distribution. So, pelvic metastasis. This was a woman with ovarian cancer, also had a, had a right nephrectomy in the past for a benign, turned out to be a benign lesion. Um, 
Only thing the PET showed was that, and you're looking back at the CT, although they didn't mention it, three millimeter nodularity. Um, this is almost certainly going to be a metastasis, uh, very unusual, although conceivable for an adrenal adenoma to be hot, but really can't, it's almost certainly going to be uh, metastatic disease, which it was. Another patient with colon cancer, only thing on the CT was this. Uh, Again, are you positive this is a MET? Do you want to give this patient incurable disease uh, because of this finding? It's not a simple cyst, but it's kind of doing a peripheral enhancing thing. Could it be hemangioma? Could it be a complex cyst or an FNH or something? Well, you don't have to worry. It's a metastasis, uh, not, a simple cyst, not a cyst, and it's not a hemangioma. Uh, next couple of cases, uh, what I like to call the wow factor, and PET being such a powerful tool and all-encompassing um, as far as what you're imaging, is what structures you're imaging, very, or not infrequently, um, the conventional workup concludes that there's really not much, if any, tumor at all, and the PET really shows you how wrong you were. Uh, this was a patient with breast cancer, right mastectomy, borderline right hyalur lymph node, um, and this tiny left axillary lymph node. However, this is a, one of the wow factor. That's certainly cancer, so is that, but everywhere else, too, uh, there's cancer. A lot of it's in the bones um, in this patient, but the PET just kind of, it's like, you're not expecting to see very much based on what you have so far, and it's like a wow. Uh, this was another case of that cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, uh, conventional imaging was essentially unremarkable, um, and it's just like, wow, tumor everywhere. This was a woman that had a mastectomy on the right um, for breast cancer with an implant placed for reconstruction. Um, initial PET scan looked nice, nothing abnormal. Had some rising tumor markers and some right breast pain. They're back in there. Um, mammogram and CT were negative. PET scan, there is this definite, uh, question, definite increased metabolism near the chest wall. It's called the likely recurrence. Uh, they tried biopsying that even. Uh, they weren't really sure what they were biopsying. It was kind of relatively blind. They didn't get anything. Um, six months later, now even more increased metabolism. Back there, finally were able to get proof uh, biopsy of uh, chest wall recurrence. Um, as you know, post-surgery and post-implants, uh, mammograms are almost useless, um, and CT can be uh, very, very hard to see anything as well. PET has no problems looking right through that area. Another patient with breast cancer, um, and you can see uh, she had rising tumor markers and some low back pain. Um, bone scan is negative. Uh, a little degenerative change here, but I will bring your attention to the right iliac wing. Um, even in retrospect, there's nothing there. Okay, um, The PET scan, Decent sized lesion in that left iliac, I'm sorry, I meant left, left iliac wing, um, decent sized lesion. And um, you look back on the CT and you know, there it is. This was read by a very good abdominal imager um, at uh, Mallinckrodt. And uh, again, the contrast of PET, you're not going to miss things. They, they jump out at you, whereas CT, you have a stack of films to go through. We don't do a good job looking at the bones. Things are hiding in there. The contrast, the the signal to noise, the signal to background, uh, tumor to background is markedly increased. You're just not going to miss these kinds of things on PET. Patient had uh, also breast cancer. Um, nodule here, is it a metastasis? Got a PET scan. And that nodule was cold. That was just a benign granuloma. However, there was this linear activity in the right transverse process where if you stare right there and you window it just right, you can say, yeah, you know what, I, get, I bet you there is a, uh, it looks like there is a lytic lesion there. Prove it on the MRI. So we don't do a great job on the bones on the CT. And more often than not, um, you'll be able to look back in retrospect and see something subtle when you know right where to look. Um, this was that same patient, the bone scan. This is a lytic lesion in the right transverse process. It's just not eliciting an osteoblastic response. It's a lytic lesion. So that often brings up the question, well then, you know, PET's so great for everything, do I still need to do a bone scan? Well, the answer is that PET and bone, the FTG PET and bone scan are really complementary. 
Remember, PET images, the lesion itself. Therefore, for lytic and marrow lesions, it's going to be better. Bone scan will image the bony remodeling around the lesion, so it's better for your blastic lesions, your more indolent lesions. Um, and remember, PET has a more limited survey, too. It's only the axial skeleton, by and large. If you had an isolated mid-femur lesion, well, um, you'd miss it on a PET scan because you just wouldn't image it. Here's a woman with breast cancer, and you can see a lytic lesion in the mid-thoracic uh, spine, which is hot. Very same patient, a blastic lesion in the sternum, which is cold. You know, this would be, this would be hot on bone scan. So um, shows how um, PET and bone scanning can be worked complementary. Okay, uh, we talked about diagnosis. We talked about staging now and restaging, and now how about response to therapy? Well, um, it's nice to know if your therapy, your chemotherapy is working. How do we assess that historically? CT, again, change in lesion size. You watch, we want something to shrink or you want it to disappear. Well, um, lesion size changes takes a while, weeks to months. And, you know, you get six, six or eight or 12 weeks of chemotherapy and a patient loses their hair and they're vomiting and they're sick. And then you realize, you know what, it wasn't even working. Well, PET looks for a change in lesion metabolism. And this occurs much quicker on the order of days or just a couple weeks for effective therapy. You look for a decrease in FDG activity, and this is one of the cases, as I mentioned earlier, where SUV is important, um, not just visual, because it, it's hard to, to tell. It's, it's, it's hard to tell visually what you can actually quantify uh, with a number. I'll mention this topic because it's kind of interesting, and um, you may have heard about it. That's the metabolic flare. Um, those patients with breast cancer that are um, estrogen receptor positive that you, or apparently so that you want to treat with tamoxifen they've noticed that if you give tamoxifen and it's going to be an effective therapy you'll see this quote metabolic flare just like the bone scan flare um, in that the partial agonist effect of the tamoxifen initially predominates. It kind of feeds the tumor for the first couple days or a week. So those tumors that are going to be effectively treated with tamoxifen will actually, you can tell by after a week, they get more metabolically active. And then eventually, the estrogen blocking effect predominates, and they become underactive. If they don't, become, if they don't flare up, though, tamoxifen is likely not going to be effective. You can also assess the um, estrogen receptor directly with F18 estradiol. Um, it's a labeled estrogen analog. Here's a woman with breast cancer, primary lesion, axillary supracollicular metastases, and pretreatment, and then into therapy, you can see everything disappear. Um, even if these lymph nodes are still there, they're not metabolically active, you can tell that very, very quickly. Effective therapy. This was a patient with colon cancer. Uh, during therapy, uh, early, before therapy, during therapy, um, and you can see everything has disappeared. Um, now, with one exception, and that is here. This liver is always going to look ugly on CT. It's hard to be able, it's hard to impossible on CT to tell what is normal and what is, what is just scarring and what is active tumor. Here we can see, while there's been a near complete response, there's still active tumor there. Look what's happened to the bone marrow. These patients get chemotherapy, they become neutropenic. Their marrow, work, their marrow works harder. Sometimes they're given uh, neupogen and other uh, marrow stimulating agents, and the marrow looks like that. It just becomes more metabolically active. So the patient, uh, they thought uh, based on CT everything was resolved. Very vague activity left retrosternally, and you can see that there's very hot, persistent disease there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about patient preparation. I mentioned earlier about the glucose issue. Um, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia are both bad for PET scannings. Hyperglycemia will competitively inhibit uh, the tumor uptake by glu of FDG. Um, hyperinsulinemia will drive FDG and um, the uh, FDG and glucose into peripheral muscle. So tumor uptake is reduced in both these states. Um, again, patient fasting for at least four hours. You'd like to see a normal blood sugar. Diabetics can be a particular problem. I, I will go up to 200 for them. Um, sometimes they're really brittle. You give them a very short-acting insulin in the morning with a little bit of a meal, bring them back a few hours later. 
um, and you can hope to get by. Some brittle diabetics who plain old just can't image. This was a patient that came for, I think it was cervical cancer staging, and hopefully by now you can see that the distribution of the radiotracer is very unusual. Um, it's all in the peripheral muscles, nothing centrally. Um, now I'll bring your attention to the right hilum and the left hip and the psoas region. They're all negative on this scan. Um, <clears throat> well, we blood sugar of this patient was normal. It was like a 150 or something. Um, asked them, however, did you eat? And they didn't realize that an egg McMuffin with bacon and cheese counted as breakfast. And what you're seeing here, even though their blood sugar was normal, is the hyperinsulinemic effect driving everything out of tumor and into the peripheral muscle. You bring them back more appropriately, fasting two days later, and you can see hip, psoas, hilum, tumor that was invisible beforehand. Very important patient preparation. This, that's the hyperinsulinemic, hyperinsulinemic effect. This was a younger gentleman with restaging for their lymphoma. And so the only thing we saw was this very faint focus in the supraclavicular region. Uh, glanced down at his prep sheet. Sugar was about 220. Um, really should not have scanned them. I think they were out of town and they really wanted to get this done um, going out of town. But given that finding and the elevated blood sugar, brought him back um, and now you can see with a blood sugar in the normal range, there's no more competitive inhibition and definitely recurrence there. This is the hyperglycemic effect, very important. Okay, a uh, number of other pitfalls um, can be had just from the normal distribution of the radio tracer if you're not aware of it. The esophagus uh, can have hot activity at the GE junction because this is a normal tonic sphincter. However, diffuse esophageal activity, if it's mild, is not unheard of and can be normal. Curvilinear left upper quadrant gastric activity is usually seen, and that's normal. Small and large bowel peristalsis. All cardiac chambers can be seen, not just the left ventricle, but the RV, and even the right atria can be very faintly seen, and they can look like lymph node metastases. Well, if they're curvilinear, call them likely uh, the atria. Uh, Bone marrow can look patchy. Really, you don't want to call bone marrow metastasis unless you're really sure that they're focal and hot. Degenerative changes in the, in the, in the spine, fractures can be increased. Uh, we'll talk about this specifically. This is an interesting topic. Brown fat hypermetabolism in the neck, shoulders, and paraspinal regions. The testes can be hot, urine contamination, or aberrant collecting systems. The breasts can be hot normally. Endometrial stripe can be hot, particularly around the time of menstruation. Any active infectious inflammatory process or a benign, a benign lesion, they can also be hot. In the mediastinum, as I said, histo and coxy, if it's hot and it's going to contraindicate surgery because it's contralateral, really need to sample that uh, with a mediastinoscopy before you don't operate. Uh, silicosis, sarcoid, TB, degenerative changes, I said fractures, post-op changes, um, post-radiation, post-chemotherapy. Um, really want to wait at least four weeks, uh, if you can, to be sure that what you're seeing reflects the actual disease and not just the inflammation. Uh, uterine fibroids, functional ovarian cysts in premenopausal women can be hot. Wait a cycle or two and repeat or get an ultrasound. Uh, endometriosis, adenomas in the thyroid, the breast. Focal thyroid activity can be malignant or it can be benign. Um, marrow and splenic rebound. Um, thyroiditis, thymic rebound, like a gallium scan. Infiltrated dose, right-sided breast cancer, you want to inject on the opposite side because if you have infiltrated dose, you'll have axillary activity. You want to make sure that you don't confuse that with axillary metastasis. Okay? Uh, any actively contracting muscle during the uptake phase following injection, so peristalsis, vocal cords. No, patient, do not talk during head and neck cancer or lymphoma imaging. Um, other skeletal muscles, back strap muscles if they're nervous. I had a patient chewing gum once, no one recognized it, and they're, all their muscles of mastication really lit up. Uh, false negatives, lower grade and less cellular tumors, those are less metabolically active or not a lot of, not a lot of cellular activity. Um, bronchial velars or mucinous, for instance, can be falsely negative, okay? Um, so post-chemotherapy, radiation, make sure you wait an appropriate amount of time. Um, cirrhotic livers can be hard to image. 
um, and just make sure the distribution makes sense, such as with this case. Uh, this was a patient with a nodule here in the left upper lung, rule out cancer. The CT of the mediastinum and hilum showed no pathologic nodes. However, on the PET scan, this was clearly hot, and there was bilateral diffuse symmetric lymph node activity. Um, well, we said this is, in the, this is malignant. Um, however, given the distribution of this, does it really make sense that a one and a half centimeter cancer is gonna have bilaterally symmetric metastases? In this case, you should say um, specifically, um, you know, maybe something inflammatory like histo or coxy or sarcoid. Um, and in this case, it, it, look for those little calcifications in the spleen or in the mediastinum as a clue as well. Um, this case, they did do a mediastinoscopy, and it turned out to be histo. Uh, we weren't quite as clever as we thought because this, this wasn't a uh, typical lung cancer. This was a pulmonary carcinoid, which can be hot as well. Bilateral adenopathy in the chest, CT. Um, bilateral massively increased activity on PET. This turned out just to be sarcoid, so you need to be very careful. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, lots of activity in the neck, shoulders, paraspinal areas. This is a very important appearance, um, not so uncommon. Um, this is normal, all normal. Uh, actually, that's tumor there, but everything else is normal. Um, brown fat and hypermetabolism and muscle um, usage during the uptake phase. Um, patients, when they're nervous, they stress their back and their neck. Um, so if you give a Valium next time to them, they might see that go away. However, there's also this activity, and it is it's actually in the fat. You don't think of fat as metabolically active, but remember from bears and hibernation and brown fat, it's generating lots of heat, um, and uh, not just in the wintertime. And you can see markedly increased FDG activity in the fat, symmetric. Don't call this cervical adenopathy. Um, this is a normal appearance, not terribly uncommon. This was a bizarre uh, case. The patient was a longtime smoker, had, had a neck cancer, and now with some new lung findings, um, you can see a couple things here, and you can see this weird stuff going around the chest wall. Um, they had this lesion, they had this lesion. Um, they're both hot. I think this turned out to be metastatic squamous cavitation, and this was another lung, this was another primary bronchogenic cancer. Um, but how about all of this stuff? And the CT from a week ago showed nothing there. Well, we got our PET CT, and as it turned out, these are just fractures, fractures and fractures. Talk to the patient, yes, they did have a bad fall. So PET CT, you do have the current CT, um, and can really help you out. I'd like to raise this issue. Uh, we talked about attenuation correction, which those are the images people generally read. However, um, it's important to look at the non-corrected images because sometimes the correction can overcorrect and make things look and make things that are real disappear. This was a patient with some fuzzy bronchi peribronchial tumor here, and there was a nodule here as well. Um, on the PET scan, this is less than blood pool. This is certainly hot. However, you pull up the non-corrected data, here's the corrected, here's the non-corrected, and that area jumps out at you. Suddenly, you can tell for real, it's real. So if it's there on the non-corrected, it's real, okay? It just got overcorrected here. Particularly in the lungs, I'm finding this is a problem. Take a glance, at least quickly, through your non-corrected data, and here we see the lesion corrected and non-corrected. <clears throat> It'll help you out. Um, okay, um, other weird things you can see, diffuse aortic wall activity. Um, not really sure what this turned out to be. It wasn't a vasculitis. This was a diffuse, uh, probably diffuse early atherosclerosis where you just have inflammation of the vessel wall. Uh, diffuse marrow activity. Okay, this is um, just going to be uh, patient on Nupagen with marrow stimulation. You want them off it for at least a week, otherwise you'll get this appearance and you won't be able to find any bone metastases because they're all hidden in there. Okay, uh, just the last couple of minutes, I'd like to, um, people are, a lot of times clinicians wonder what the CT part of the PET CT is for. Well, remember the CT can provide the attenuation correction, although you don't need it to do that. Um, but it, when you do, it's much faster than standalone PET. Um, fusion is 
uh, allows a more precise localization of lesions than standalone PET. Um, it's, not, it's often not used in diagnostic quality mode. We use a high pitch or low KVP with no contrast, but it's not bad. Um, I give a disclaimer in my report saying this is not a diagnostic CT. Don't read it independently of uh, the PET images. However, all these, almost all the CT images I showed you are from a PET CT, and you can see that they're not bad. They're like you know an outside exam that with no contrast. Um, One-stop shopping is certainly the future, though. People are going to come for a PET CT, get their PET and their diagnostic CT all at the same time. So, what does PET CT do for you? I used to be a little reluctant and downplayed the advantages because I, I, I grew up reading pure PET and. Um, as a radiologist as well as nuclear medicine physician, I was able to, I thought I had a great handle of the anatomy cross-sectionally on PET. Um, but some of the, some of the uh, advantages of PET CT is you always have the current CT, okay? Um, one of the big problems with PET centers is you have to have, get the CT, have them ship it to you, get it back to them, get the report, hang it up. You always know you're gonna have a digital right there current CT, so exam is, easier to read, it's faster to acquire. Um, some early literature, although the jury's still out, a report, a, few, a paper a couple uh, recently in the in, in New England Journal looked at lung cancer staging and they said 40% of the time PET CT finds more than uh, clinically relevant information than just a PET alone looking at the CT side by side. Um, I'm not sure about that, if it's that high. You know, the question is, are you radiology trained and nuclear trained? I think it's easier for a radiologist to learn to read PET than a nuclear medicine to learn to read, uh, a physician to learn to read a CT. It's kind of a, uh, I think it's true, but you can certainly go in either direction. Um, as I say, I've been converted. I, I'm, I'm a fan of it. I find anecdotally, and I've talked to some of my colleagues, and they have a similar impression. Um, that if you know how to read both well, uh, it still makes a difference about a 20% of the time. I'm finding, I'm very glad I had this fused PET CT. Um, hardware versus software fusion. You can have a software program import your PET and your CT and fuse them, but the patient's not in the same position and it often doesn't work quite as well. I still, I, I'm, I've become a believer, I must admit, uh, that it does make a difference to some extent, the hardware fusion. So, in summary, um, Talking about whole body oncologically, PET will more accurately identify metastases from most tumors, altering stage and clinical management. Um, PET will more accurately, more accurately assess response to therapy, either after completion or during treatment, um, and can be useful on occasion um, for identifying malignancy, making the diagnosis, particularly with solitary pulmonary nodules, guiding biopsies. When do you order PET? Whenever the management will be changed by additional information after the conventional workup. And I think PET is still underutilized. I think people um, would have more accurate staging and better patient management if they would use PET more routinely. Of course, I'm biased. So we've covered basic physics as biology, some imaging protocols, clinical uses, briefly cardiac. Again, depends how the economics plays out. Uh, it's a good tool, but MRI is also coming on strong. Uh, neurologic, we spent some more time on, um, where Alzheimer's has a big potential to play, um, should it be approved. Whole body oncologic uses um, was the majority of our time. Pitfalls we talked about, and PET CT. Um, where are we headed in the future? We'll continue to add more cancers to our list. Alzheimer's will be big. New labels, not just FDG, but uh, dopamine and hormones and antibodies and other receptors. Inflammatory imaging, FUO. Uh, bone scanning with F18, do a PET bone scan. Um, people are starting to do that. And I think we'll see PET CT combinations becoming uh, the future uh, and the standard. We're going to cover a bunch of topics, starting from the top of the head, so from eyes to thighs, as it were, starting with a few artifacts that you need to be aware of. Why? Because if you don't know your artifacts, you're going to overcall or undercall lesions. For example, let's look at one of the commonest artifacts. The commonest radiopharmaceutical we use is technetium 99 m in one form or another. If you have free pertechnotate in any part of the body, then you must be aware of where it accumulates, typically anywhere in the blood pool, 
and it is excreted in the major and minor salivary glands as well as by the gastric epithelium. Be aware of this normal biodistribution of free pertechnitate because you are apt to call overcall causes of active GI bleeding if you don't know what's going on. Another example is knowing what radiopharmaceutical has been injected. If instead of injecting a bone avid agent, you inject a glomerular filtering agent, then you're going to get a kidney scan instead of a bone scan. This does not mean this is an abnormal bone scan. This means this is a normal kidney scan. So please be aware of the agent that has been injected. Another type of artifact is knowing whether you are peaked the camera has been peaked correctly in order to image the agent that has been injected. This is an example of early imaging for a thallium agent, but you have not windowed it correctly. You have not peaked the camera. However, during delayed images, you can see that there is indeed good signal-to-noise ratio and left and right ventricular uptake because the technologist has determined that the correct peak has been set up in the interim. Remember your quality control measures at the beginning of the day, week, or month, and these have different frequencies as outlined in your syllabus. It's the first appendix. If you do not have a uniform flood field, this is a uniform flood field. This is a heterogeneous or non-uniform flood field. You are going to get various types of filling defects or photopenic areas. Not all of these are discrete, and they may indeed mimic a parenchymal lesion causing replacement of that flood field. The phantoms are in different types and shapes, and these will assess resolution, linear resolution, as well as three-dimensional resolution depending on the type of phantom. That having been said, we're going to start by looking at the head and neck. Now, we've discussed thyroid imaging, so we're not going to cover that in any great detail today. The remainder of the head and neck has to do with cerebral perfusion and dementia, ventricular shunt function evaluation, ventricular reflux studies, a little bit about head and neck cancer, which we spoke of already yesterday, and don't forget the parathyroid adenoma, for which nuclear medicine is an unbelievably accurate study. When you want to study cerebral perfusion, what you are doing is assessing the angiographic phase. So we're not studying all of cerebral perfusion. We're only assessing the early arterial phase of cerebral perfusion. You want to look at the trident of Willis, and you want to see antegrade flow in the anterior circulation. It's a very simple thing to do. You want to look for cortical activity to look for significant defects or hypoperfuse segments, but that is not the purpose of the study. The only thing you're trying to support is the clinical diagnosis of brain death. This is not diagnostic of, but helps the neurologist determine additional objective evidence for clinical brain death, typically before disconnecting somebody from a ventilator, typically before harvesting young organs immediately after death. You want to disregard dural venous activity because there is contamination from venous structures as well as the posterior circulation. You want to disregard scalp activity because this has contributions from the external carotid arterial supply, which means this has nothing to do with the clinical criteria for brain death. You have to have an intact internal carotid arterial circulation in order to diagnose the presence or absence of arrested cerebral perfusion. If ever in doubt, these two areas are things that people lack confidence in calling. If you're in doubt, you see dural venous or scalp activity, something you can do very easily is repeat the study within 24 hours. You're rid of those additional activities and you're confident in your diagnosis of arrested cerebral perfusion. Remember, active cerebral perfusion, you're going to see the origins of the great vessels. You're going to see internal carotid flow ascending up to the level of the skull base. You see the trident of the circle of Willis. This has to be seen instantly. Always try and review this on the monitor because it's a cinematic display. The static images do it no justice at all. If you do not see activity entering the skull base and the circle of Willis, but you do see some degree of scalp or dural venous activity, this is a arrested cerebral perfusion. Remember, you are not responsible for the diagnosis or the absence of diagnosis of brain death. That is a clinical diagnosis. All we're telling the neurologist is whether or not there is arrested cerebral perfusion. Why is this important? If you take a large volume of persons who are clinically brain death, 
almost all of them are going to have arrested cerebral perfusion. Why almost all and not every one of them is a question we're often asked. That is because of technical factors. If you do not use specific technical criteria, if you're not looking for the trident of Willis, if you don't have cinematic displays, if you don't image early enough, you are going to overcall or undercall the presence of arrested cerebral perfusion. If you're clinically brain dead, and that is an accurate clinical diagnosis using certain very specific criteria, you are going to have 100% of arrested cerebral perfusion. So if you used experienced neurosurgical or neurological criteria, these are the criteria for brainstem death. All of these persisting for a period of six hours or more, none of them will recover. This has 100% accuracy, and all of them are going to have arrested cerebral perfusion. If you carry on imaging, this is not required, but if you wish, you can carry on imaging beyond the angiographic phase to the extracellular phase. In the extracellular phase, you do not see significant cortical activity. This may help you if you have difficulty deciding whether activity you see is in the scalp, in the dural venous sinus, or indeed within the cortex itself. You do not see any cortical activity, but you do see significant nasopharyngeal activity. This is called any combination of the hot nose. Remember, the nasopharynx is highly vascular and supplied by branches of the external carotid artery. And the empty head sign, because you do not see any significant cortical activity, you do see some scalp activity and some dural venous sinus activity. Again, no evidence of cerebral perfusion, all you see are empty head signs. Why is it important if, as I have presented to you, every time you have an accurate neurosurgical diagnosis of brain death, why is it necessary to get this additional study? This is because you want to give additional objective evidence before disconnecting patients. More importantly, for harvesting purposes, the longer you keep the patients on a ventilator, on life support measures, the more expensive it's going to be. These objective criteria also help friends and family come to terms with the potential of being a harvested organ donor. So it has to do with psychological as well as fiscal responsibility. One of the pitfalls is the presence of persistent cerebellar perfusion. What do you do when you see no cerebral perfusion, but you do see some or significant cerebellar perfusion? Remember, the diagnosis of scintigraphic brain death depends upon the presence or absence of arrested cerebral perfusion. Patients without cerebral perfusion are diagnosed brain death. Just because you have viable cerebellar tissue does not have any correlation with the diagnosis of clinical brain death. So again, you don't want to look outside of the cerebral hemispheres. You don't want to look outside of the trident of Willis. The less you look at, the more specific you're going to be, the more confident you're going to be in the diagnosis of brain death. Remember this. If already the patient has a diagnosis of clinical brain death before they come to you, the chances are the patient is probably brain dead already. You're just giving supplementary evidence. Let's look a little bit about dementia. There are typically three types of major dementia. Dementia of multiple infarctions, which is the commonest. Dementia of Alzheimer type, which is more common in women. And dementia of the PIC type, which is more common in men. There is a laundry list of other dementias which are much rarer when we take the sum of these three types of dementia together. Conventionally, the diagnosis of dementia is made by looking at the degree of parenchymal volume loss or atrophy on a CT or an MRI using either qualitative or quantitative criteria. If you look at all adults over the age of 18, approximately half of us have volume loss. We all know I do. It does not correlate with impaired cognitive function. If you look at only those adults who are under the age of 65 years, most of, them, most of us do not have atrophic brain parenchyma, so we do not have volume loss. If you look at adults between the age of 65 and 75 years, again, most adults in this age group do not have parenchymal volume loss. So it is incorrect to indicate that people with volume loss have volume loss which is concordant with senescent changes or age-related. Just because you grow older doesn't mean your brain has to shrink. The older you get, the more likely you are to get parenchymal volume loss, but it is not invariable. In this age group of patients between 75 and 85 years, 
I examined them over a 10-year period, and you can see that more patients did not have volume loss compared to those people who did have volume loss. But remember, as you grow older, the incidence of dementia, especially dementia of Alzheimer's and PICS type, increase. Also, as you grow older, you're more likely to have smaller infarctions and hence dementia of multiple infarctions. However, if you're older than 85 years of age, you are more likely, 81% of you are more likely to have parenchymal volume loss than no atrophy at all, which is paradoxical because if you have reached the age of 85 without a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia, you will not get Alzheimer's dementia. Bottom line, the presence or absence of parenchymal volume loss on a CT study or an MR study correlates not at all with the diagnosis of dementia, which means we need other objective criteria. What can we do? We can do low-resolution SPECT scanning, which is using any kind of cerebral perfusion agent and looking at the functional phase, or use PET scanning, as Dr. Applebaum has briefly alluded to. However, why is PET scanning not approved for the diagnosis of dementia? By the time cognitive impairment has been diagnosed in somebody with any type of dementia, it is too late to treat them. Therefore, the diagnosis is not going to alter patient outcome. It is not going to change the natural history of the dementia. Once diagnosed, it is an irreversible phenomenon at the cellular and microscopic level, and so there's not much to be done about it. However, if you diagnose it correctly, if you diagnose dementia of Alzheimer's type correctly using various patterns of hypoperfusion and hypometabolic changes using a PET scan, then you can avert a large amount of cost which is incurred in other studies trying to find the cause of the dementia. Again, the patterns of dementia correlate with the type of dementia, which may be either non-progressive or progressive. Again, there's a problem over here. There is a significant fraction of people with non-progressive dementia who have normal PET scans. So even a normal PET scan does not rule in or rule out the diagnosis of dementia. Hence, right now, we don't have very much to help us with the diagnosis of dementia. We do know that if the PET scan diagnoses Alzheimer's dementia efficiently and quickly, in those cases, if you've got a good positive predictor of a test, then you're going to save millions of dollars. What is more important? Clinical probability. If you know clinically that the patient has either probable or possible dementia, then your chances of diagnosing it, the sensitivity and specificity, are both much more superior to the FTG PET examination. So I do not believe that in the near foreseeable future, PET will ever achieve approval from CMS for diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. Ventricular studies are commonly done in association with neurosurgery, and these are typically done for two reasons. One is to look for ventricular reflux. Ventricular reflux is one of those functional indicators of responsive normal pressure hydrocephalus. This means that if you have normal pressure hydrocephalus diagnosed by anatomic studies and clinical findings, and you demonstrate ventricular reflux in these patients, up to three quarters of them will respond. Only their gait abnormality will respond to shunting. So again, it's a very, very specific item, and you've got to know that this is very limited indication. How do you perform this test? You inject DTPA, indium-111, into the lumbar subarachnoid space. Remember, you've got to charge for your subarachnoid injection. And then you want to image them at the early phase and then two days later for the delayed imaging. In the early imaging, all you're trying to determine is whether or not you have indeed injected in the subarachnoid space and there is no stasis in the epidural phase. Uh, epidural space, if you are sure that you have injected into subarachnoid space, which means you've collected CSF for sampling or just to determine that you are indeed in the correct location, there is absolutely no need to get your early phase images. However, as the protocol, it's just better to have the early phase images. The delayed phase is carried out on day two, which is 48 hours after the injection of, of uh, radiopharmaceutical in the lumbar subarachnoid space. If I see ventricular reflux that is stasis within the ventricular system itself, then I know that there is ventricular reflux. These patients, if shunted, will show response in their gait abnormality only. They will not have improved cognitive impairments. So it's a very limited study.
Ventricular shunt patency, on the other hand, it's a different type of study. Here are children or adults who have ventricular shunt catheters. We typically get an anatomic shunt tubing study, which is a lateral and frontal long exposure to look for anatomic discontinuities in shunt tubing. Be aware that segments of shunt tubing or revised or extensor ports, as well as the reservoir, themselves may be radiolucent. The newer shunt tubings have entirely radiopaque shunt tubings with little dots along their surface so you can determine whether or not there is anatomic discontinuity. However, in order to have shunt failure, you do not need to have anatomic discontinuity. What you're looking for is functional impairment, which means that somewhere along the tubing, typically at its caudal end and or its terminus, there is an obstruction to the rapid and quick spontaneous flow, which is respiratory related of the CSF from dilated ventricles or the lumbar subarachnoid space or a dilated hydrosyringomyelia into its terminus, which is typically the peritoneum. What you do is you want to inject DTPA into the reservoir, which is typically done by the neurosurgical nurse, and you want to assess activity along the tubing over time. Remember, in the normal state, every time the person breathes, fluid is going to be transmitted into the peritoneal cavity. So there is really no need to get delayed images. As soon as you inject into the reservoir fluid, which is now filled with radiopharmaceutical, is going to immediately get propelled along the shunt tubing into the peritoneal space, and you get a peritoneographic effect, which looks very similar to contrast that leaks out to fallopian tubes and outlines bowel loops. So if you get a peritoneographic effect within minutes, you don't have to wait for even 20 minutes to get this kind of effect. You know that the shunt is unobstructed. However, if you have stasis within the tube, the reservoir itself, or if you have backflow or ventricular reflux, in these cases you know that there is some kind of functional obstruction or defect in the shunt tubing itself. So this is an obstructed ventricular shunt which needs neurosurgical treatment. Looking at head and neck cancer, which we have yesterday, we know that FTG-PET is much more sensitive and specific when compared with only clinical examination, but always remember to get a CT study because it is equivalent to CT, and if you have a negative CT study, if you don't have foci of nodal enlargement, fibrosis, scarring, or post-surgical change, then there is really no need to get a PET scan. The negative predictive value of CT is very high. The positive predictive value of FTG-PET is very high as well. So you might want to combine CT and PET to see where these bright areas, hypermetabolic areas on PET are when you compare them to a contemporaneous CT. This is again the most excellent argument for having a PET CT scan. Why do you want to buy a new PET scanner if you could be buying a PET CT scanner instead? Remember, at the current time, all evidence is anecdotal. There is no significant published literature that tells you that a PET CT scanner is of any greater utility than a PET scanner itself or PET CT fusion overlay. It's just market driven because my neighbor has a PET CT scanner, I want to buy three of them. Uh, another area that we've got to be aware of, as we've discussed yesterday, is artifacts in head and neck imaging using FTG. The longissimus muscles are going to show significant hypermetabolic activity because during the uptake phase, patients are moving their heads around, they're adjusting themselves. The paraspinous muscles are going to show activity because you're going to adjust your head in the gurney or in the resting phase. The supraclavicular muscles are going to show uptake. The trapezius and scalenae muscles will show uptake. Some activity may be seen within the esophagus because it is excreted by salivary glands. Activity is seen in the larynx as well as the thyroid gland. Remember, significant thyroid hyperactivity is seen more commonly in women than in men, and therefore you do not want to do an FTG PET scan for thyroid cancer unless you know that there has been prior surgical or radiochemical ablation of the thyroid parenchyma. Significant thyroid activity is the rule. It does not mean you have thyroiditis or a thyroid cancer. It is just one of those artifacts. It is part of the normal biodistribution. The more you talk, the more uptake you're going to get in the area of the laryngeal muscles. You can get idiopathic activity with stasis of fluid within molecular sinuses in the laryngeal apparatus as well.
Pyroid imaging, we've covered this before. Sonography is used to guide biopsy. The role for nuclear medicine is either in the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid hyperfunction or thyroid cancer. FTG PET right now is not fully CMS approved. It is only approved in those patients who've had their entire thyroid gland previously removed. The histology was follicular in nature. They have an elevated serum thyroglobulin level. I have to correct myself. Uh, There was a typographic error in the slide. The level of the thyroglobulin should be more than 10 nanograms per cc and not milligrams. Uh, It is correctly stated in your syllabus. And, of course, you have to have this preceded by a negative whole body I-131 scan. So very, very limited indication for FTG PET in thyroid cancer. Non-FTG PET agents are currently a work in progress. How do you evaluate someone who has an indeterminate fine needle aspiration? Look at the uptake and scan. If the uptake and scan shows increased activity, depending on whether or not the patient is thyrotoxic or euthyroid, you may or may not choose to treat them with lower doses of iodine-131, typically in the 25 to 50 millicurie range. If you have known thyroid cancer, elevated thyroglobulin, and you know the histology, depending upon the histology, you want to start with a whole body scan. If it's non-medullary, an I-131 scan. If it's medullary, an Indium-111 scan. Only if these are negative, you would consider an FTG PET examination, remembering it's only approved for follicular histologies at the current time. Parathyroid studies are used in the determination of recurrent or residual hyperfunctioning parathyroid adenomas in the presence of idiopathic hypercalcemia. It is also used in patients who are high risk for surgery during the initial surgery or if there is life-threatening hypercalcemia. Always remember these washout MIBI studies. You do initial imaging at 20 minutes after injection and delayed imaging at two hours after injection. Very easy to look for foci that are persistent and do not wash out two hours after the study has been initiated. Always add an intraoperative gamma probe. This is a functional study or doing counting. You don't have images in the operating theater. Addition of this is equivalent to the complementary use of CT, MR, or sonography to your initial SESTAMIB washout scan. Nodules, brighter, and they stay that way two hours after injection of MIB. Going on to the chest itself, few areas where nuclear medicine really helps, myocardial perfusion, which is typically the bread and butter of any nuclear medicine department, unless the cardiologists have successfully stolen it from you. Radionuclide ventriculograms, ventilation and lung perfusion studies, and very important, the sentinel node map. People often ask, when will sentinel node mapping for either melanoma or breast cancer be replaced by a PET scan? And the answer is never, and we'll talk about why in a few minutes. Let's start with the myocardial perfusion study. This is not rocket science. We want to assess myocardial reserve, which means is the heart capable of recruiting additional vascular flow? In order to see this additional flow problem, we want to stress the heart out. We use various protocols. This is the protocol that I use. There is no significant difference depending on whether you use a one-day, two-day, three-day or two half-day protocols, depending on which agent you use initially, whether you use a lower dose or a higher dose. Use whatever protocol is convenient to you. We don't like to to delay too much, so we do everything in one day. It's a one-half-day setting. We use a combination of radio tracers, thallium-201 chloride initially, and technesium 99 m MeB later. Uh, What you're assessing for is relative vascular flow reserves, so you've got to know approximate distribution of coronary arterial flow within the left ventricle. Remember, if the myocardium is perfect in uh, capacity and reserve, it is able to dilate to an adequate degree, and therefore it can recruit blood flow from neighboring regions and perfuse a larger volume of functioning muscle when stressed. If it is not able to mount this reserve, this area is visualized by you as a defect in perfusion. So if you've got a defect in perfusion, which is worse during stress than at rest, then this means there is likely ischemia. However, if you have a defect that shows no change whatsoever, it is an area of scarring. What you want to look for is any area of reversible segmental hypoperfusion. 
That's the entire crux of the story of coronary imaging. You've got to have a significant mismatch, which is more than 50% of a mismatch, in order to have significant relative flow disturbances. So sometimes you're going to miss a lesion on myocardial perfusion studies, but there's going to be significant coronary compromise on a coronary angiogram. And that's because you haven't achieved that threshold, which is required to determine relative flow reserve disturbances. Myocardial perfusion imaging can correlate somewhat with the coronary artery itself that is responsible for perfusing that area of the left ventricle. But there are so many anomalies in arterial anatomy that it is not worth trying to predict which artery is going to show significant stenosis. Uh, what is going to happen in the future? It's, it's probably going to be replaced by some positron emitters. Unlike uh, FDG, which can be dispatched to you via FedEx, for rubidium, you need to have it either in the coach or in-house. You've got to have a generator that can dispose of this immediately. So various agents are used. Typically, you want to fast someone for four hours. Uh, stress is typically carried out under the supervision of cardiology, so they can ensure that these patients have been stable for at least a period of 48 hours. If they are unable to undergo standard exercise stress protocols, you can chemically stress them. Chemical stress can either be performed using vasodilators or positive ino or chronotropic agents. Again, no significant difference between these. However, the most important thing you've got to remember is the degree of stress that the heart has to undergo. If the patient does not achieve a minimum of 85% heart risk, which means you've got a target heart rate. The target heart rate is determined by the patient's stated age. If you do not achieve your 85% of your target heart rate during your exercise, you need to stop the exercise and administer one of these chemical compounds. If you do not do that since you haven't achieved the threshold, the study is going to be not sensitive enough in the detection of fall of myocardial reserve. That is very, very important. You need a combination of planar and SPECT imaging. Typically, you want to do it in a comfortable position, whether it's supine or left lateral. If you're using a multiple-headed SPECT camera, it doesn't make much of a difference. We always image our patients with and without attenuation correction using a gadolinium correction source. This is important because there are certain artifacts that you have to be familiar with. For example, the diaphragm is going to show up as some hypoperfused areas in men. The anteroceptal region is going to show up as hypoperfused areas more commonly in women. If prominent pectoral muscles or prominent breast tissue is seen anteriorly, you're going to get anterior attenuation artifacts. Be aware that these can be corrected by attenuation correction software, which is universally available. Also be aware you want to review the attenuation corrected images only, and this is very important, if you suspect that there is an attenuation-related artifact on your pre-corrected images. This software is so good that sometimes it tends to overcorrect artifacts. So it will create artifacts or it will create falsely negative results where there are none. So get your attenuation-corrected images, but don't look at them unless you think you need to look at them in every case. Uh, increasing lung uptake and left ventricular cavitary dilation. These are areas of diminished cardiac reserve. Remember, increasing uptake in the right ventricle should be at least as bright, if not brighter, than the left ventricle. The left ventricular dilation is a gestalt a thing, you just have to look at it and know whether or not the left ventricle is large enough. Some of the newer softwares are going to actually compute this for you, and you can give a quantitative measurement of transient apparent left ventricular cavitary dilation. Again, if you see this, or if you see increasing lung activity, then these are signs of congestive heart failure or significantly impaired cardiac reserve. In your myocardial perfusion report, please indicate the condition of the patient at the time of injection. Did he or she achieve at least 85% of the heart rate at the time of injection? How much tracer was administered? What was the dose and route of administration? Is the myocardial distribution uniform or not? Very important. If you have heterogeneous perfusion patterns, this, this may reflect multiple vessels, typically 
double or triple vessel disease. If you have double or triple vessel disease, it's going to be very difficult to look for regional hypoperfused myocardial segments. This is probably the most important thing that people often fail to mention in their myocardial perfusion consultations. Talk about the shape of the left ventricle. Does it look normal? It should be only slightly larger than the right ventricle. Is it round or is it misshapen? Are there eccentric outpouchings which may or may not suggest the presence of paradoxical motion and or aneurysms? True or false? What is the left ventricular ejection fraction? The computer will calculate this for you. Look for areas of regional thickening of myocardium. The entire myocardium should pulsate together if you don't have ectopic beats. If you've got a normal study, you don't have significant changing between the post-stress and resting images. The key is to look for a defect, segmental hypoperfusion on your post-stress image, which demonstrates reperfusion on your resting image, which infers that there is exertional ischemia, exertion induced either by exercise stress or by chemical vasodilatation or inotropic agents. Remember, for a true lesion, you are best, most confident if you see this in at least two of three planes. However, this, this is more of a rule of thumb and not a true thing in real life. Sometimes I will see a defect that reperfuses, but with confidence, only in one plane. You should call lesions that you see with one plane only. It is very important if you are struggling to determine whether or not a lesion is coming back in one plane only, it probably is not. Again, not rocket science. If there is a bite and the bite comes back, it's a reperfusible defect. It's segmental ischemia. One of the tools we do use in order to get more of a quantitative mechanism is a qualitative bullseye analysis or polar map. This makes it very easy for cardiologists to read their own studies because they look at colors. If you see no color and the color comes back, you know that it is reperfusible ischemia. Again, you don't see significant blood flow. You don't see significant improvement in blood flow when compared with the stressed image. So you know that this is a fixed perfusion defect. The computer will actually calculate how significant this fixed defect is when compared with the rest of the volume of the left ventricle. Here, on the other hand, you've got a reversible hypoperfuse defect. You see significant defect along the inferior wall, and then you see most of it coming back, except a tiny bit at the apex, and this is a significant re significantly reversible hypoperfuse segment, which indicates that there is significant exertional ischemia. If you compare the sensitivity and specificity of stress versus chemical studies, so exercise stress versus vasodilators or inotropic or chronotropic agents, you're actually surprised to see that the chemical study is more sensitive and more specific. At our institution, we use a combination of chemical or stress testing. Mostly we use chemical testing, and our numbers are quite equivalent. I, I strongly recommend this kind of exercise. We do this every six monthly to anybody who's just starting a nuclear cardiology program in your institution, because this tells you how what the national average is, how specific and how sensitive you should be, and if you're not, then you should probably be doing things to improve your imaging and or your interpretation. A risk stratification, the risk of a cardiac event or sudden cardiac death, exponentially goes up depending on whether you have no perfusion defect, a fixed perfusion defect, or a reversible perfusion defect. Remember, even if you have no perfusion defects, you still have a 1% risk of sudden cardiac death. So it's not 100% as nothing is. Uh, using your algorithm for risk stratification. Remember, if you have no risk factors for coronary artery disease, you don't need to get a coronary arteriogram. If you have a high risk factor, if you have multiple risk factors and clinical symptomatology that needs workup, you don't need a myocardial perfusion study. You need to go ahead and get a coronary arteriogram anyway. It's the intermediate category that is going to come to us for myocardial perfusion imaging. How do you stratify this? If you're low intermediate, you just get a stress test with an EKG. You go ahead and get a myocardial perfusion study only if this is positive. If this is negative, you do not need further workup. If you have high intermediate levels of suspicion, and again, these numbers 
are very specific because you are assigned a score depending upon family history, symptoms, serum chemistry, etc. So you get these specific numbers by adding up your cadenza score and then you fall into these categories. So again, to rephrase, if you're at low risk, you don't need a coronary arteriogram. If you're at high risk, you don't need a myocardial perfusion study. If you're in the intermediate category, depending on whether you're intermediate low or intermediate high, you're going to get an exercise stress test with or without a myocardial perfusion study. When you get your exercise stress test, you should also be able to analyze wall thickness of the left ventricle, wall thickness as well as wall motion. These are subtle areas which determine those segments of the left ventricle that are high risk for loss of myocardial reserve in the future. So don't just look at the perfusion pattern. Look for areas of abnormal or absent wall thickening. Look for areas of paradoxical or decreased or increased wall motion. This can also be graphically presented. You want to see how much of the left ventricle contracts at a given time, and the computer also segmentally breaks up this into segments, which help you assign a sum stress score and look at wall thickness as well as wall motion. So not just perfusion, but look at functional characteristics of the left ventricular wall. Another way of looking at the left ventricular function is by an independent test called the dynamic ventriculogram, which is really a blood pool test. What you're doing is you're labeling many red blood cells, autologous red blood cells, flowing them back into the patient's body and watching them as they get pumped out of the heart. This helps you determine the amount of left ventricular ejection of the fraction of red blood cells that are within it as compared to those that are going to leave it in a background of no significant activity. Normal left ventricular ejection fraction is approximately 55%. This is one of those studies which is going to be a baseline in patients who are going to undergo very cardiotoxic chemotherapy in the future, as well as follow-up if you're on multiple drugs for ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Remember, all you're ass assessing is left ventricular ejection fraction. It is difficult and quite impossible to assess right ventricular ejection fraction unless you have specific software for this and you inject autologous labeled red blood cells within the right ventricular cavity itself and make allowances for correction of left ventricular contamination. So what you're typically doing is you're reporting left ventricular ejection fraction. Look at the volume contraction curve. You saw the normal volume contraction curve a little bit ahead. The M or the slope of that was much lower. You've got to see a valley or a dip. You do not see a dip. The slope of the left ventricular contraction curve is much lower, indicating less of a push, which is reflected by less of an ejection fraction. It's less than 55% plus minus 6 you also want to look at the beat histogram. The beat histogram should be monochromatic, which means all of the left ventricle should be beating at the same time and at one time only. If it is polychromatic, which means you get different colored spikes, the software is telling us that different segments of the left ventricle are contracting at different times. This is very inefficient. You're pushing out less autologous red blood cells at different times, and you're not being very efficient. So you do not want to report the right ventriculogram. You're only interested in the left ventriculogram. When you do a radionuclide ventriculogram, you want to do it at exercise as well as at stress. Stress may be with Sorry, at stress as well as at rest. Stress may be chemical or using exercise. If you've got an inappropriate response to stress when compared with the resting ventriculogram, you know that you have impending compromise of left ventricular function. Again, important for ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Look for transient left ventricular chamber dilation. Look for, look for transient increase in the lung blood pool as well. So again, analysis is very similar to myocardial perfusion studies, but you're going to be more specific about the functional anatomy of the left ventricular chamber. One of the errors in left ventricular imaging is positioning. You have to position these patients in a left anterior oblique projection so you don't get contamination from the right ventricle. This is very important because small changes in positioning can cause significant changes in measurement of left ventricular ejection fraction, and this may end up excluding your patients from certain chemotherapeutic protocols. If you have heart rate variability, the left ventricular ejection fraction is completely 
completely inaccurate. A small rhythm strip is included in our images and in our analysis for LVEF studies because if you have any significant irregularity, for example, atrial fibrillation, the left ventricular ejection fraction is going to be necessarily abnormal and it's going to be unreportable. You can give a qualitative analysis but not a quantitative one because the number itself depends upon the R to R interval. Ventilation and lung perfusion scans. Is a chest radiograph necessary? According to conventional wisdom, if you've had a chest radiograph in the last 24 hours and you have no new signs or symptoms, it's really not necessary to get another chest radiograph to correlate with your lung ventilation and or perfusion study. However, there's another school of thought which indicates that if you have a new sign or symptom, which is the reason why you're doing the ventilation perfusion study, you need to get a chest radiograph. Again, you can go either way with whatever you're comfortable with. You can use many agents for ventilation and significant agents for perfusion. Again, that's up to you. We use xenon and DTPA aerosol. Ventilation studies are used by a single breath technique, and then you breathe a combination of room air and the xenon 133 itself or the technetium aerosol. You want to continue with your washout images. You can either do this in the posterior projection or multiple projections. You can do multiple projections only if you're using technetium 99 MDTP aerosol because it stays around for a longer time. You do not have significant time to image xenon 133 in multiple positions, which is one of the limitations of that agent. How do you analyze these images? On the single breath, if you have no compliance errors, you must be able to see activity within ventilated lung segments bilaterally in a symmetric fashion. As time goes by, you should see symmetric and prompt wash out of this material. If you do not see wash out promptly, then you have obstructive lung disorder. If you do not have wash in promptly, you have a restrictive lung disorder. So on your ventilation images, you're looking for symmetry, promptness of wash in and wash out. You're looking for restrictive or obstructive lung disorders. You're checking to see if this is global, symmetric, if it's asymmetric, whether it's segmental or subsegmental. Lung perfusion studies are typically done using eight projections. However, if you're doing a qualitative study, which we often do in pre-surgical patients who have lung cancer in whom we want to assess for the presence of how much reserve lung will there be after I whack off a segment, a lobe, or a lung, you want to omit the lateral images. Why is this? You're giving in your report or consultation qualitative fractions of activity in the left and right lungs divided into equal thirds. Using lateral images, you're getting signal contamination from the opposite side. So you're going to emit the lateral images when you do qualitative studies. In an effort not to confuse too many people, we just get six images for qualitative as well as quantitative perfusion studies. How does this work? This is again a blood pool imaging agent. However, these blood pool imaging studies are tagged onto particles which are macro-aggregated albumin. If you have any free protectinate, there's going to be signal contamination and you will see activity in the salivary glands, the thyroid glands. Anything excreted by the salivary glands is going to be in the nasopharynx as well as in the stomach and the intestines and sometimes in the kidneys. Remember that this is an artifact of contamination because of technique. Using six to eight projections, you want to look at the distribution of the macro-aggregated albumin. This is going to cause a physiologic elevation of pulmonary arterial thrombosis. So you are exacerbating any arterial thrombosis that exists, but at a microscopic level that is not clinically significant. You should see fairly uniform distribution of these particles within segments of both lungs. This is very sensitive, but it is not specific, which means anything that causes significant blockage of the pulmonary arteries in their first, second, or third order branches is going to show up as a defect or focal photopenia in the lung capillary bed. However, it's not specific. Anything that changes blood flow makes the study abnormal. This also includes artifacts in the flood field. This looks like a persistent defect, but if you look at your flood field, there's a defect in the photomultiplier tube mechanism, and therefore you're being fooled into thinking that there is indeed a true defect in the pulmonary vascular bed, when in fact there is none. 
if you use too few particles, there is a, an artifactual defect because some of your pulmonary capillary bed is not being blocked by these MAA particles. Why? You have less particles and more capillaries, so some flow is still continuing in part of your capillary bed. So again, very heterogeneous mottled pictures. Particles may clump. The, the syringe must be agitated, not just shaken. It must be agitated, and the injection should be in the upright position. If not, you're going to get clumping of particles, which causes a heterogeneous or mottled appearance. This, again, is going to confuse you into thinking that there is some degree of pulmonary arterial capillary thrombosis, when, in fact, there is none. This is a classic example of a study done which is technically poor, and then it is repeated after one week, and you can see that that is normal. These hot spots are because of blood clots in the syringe. Whenever possible, we try to avoid injecting within a central line or, ve or a venous access port. It is best to inject in the upright position. A normal perfusion study is homogeneous. You do not really appreciate any quantum model because you try and block as many capillaries as possible. And no matter how you turn the patient, the images look homogeneous and sharply uniform. An abnormal perfusion study is going to be a negative effect which means those areas that are blocked by you, by your macroaggregated albumin, is going to show up as a photon-rich area. Those areas that are blocked by the pulmonary arterial thrombus are going to be photopenic areas, and those represent the actual pulmonary arterial thrombus. So you see a very heterogeneous pattern because you're seeing a combination of segmental and subsegmental defects. What about during pregnancy? The dose that is administered does not cause significant secretion in breast milk. It is secreted, but it is not significant enough to cause any radiation hazard to the infant. The, the risk in the child from a ventilation perfusion scan is pretty low. So according to that, it might be of preference to do just a perfusion scan rather than a ventilation and perfusion scan or a pulmonary CT angiogram in someone who's pregnant or nursing. Uh, Pyopet criteria, these, these are absolutely archaic, and uh, I don't know why we still use them, probably because we don't have anything better. So we're using something that is outdated, useless, and quite frankly, boring. What we've got is we divide things into the normal and high categories, which are easily understood. If it's normal, you don't have to treat these people. If it's high probability, then you probably have to treat these people or they will die. But look at the numbers. 14% are normal, 13% are in the high category. Everybody else, which is the majority, falls into the low and indeterminate category. This is why we in nuclear medicine get a bad name. We say things are indeterminate or indeterminate or it's low to intermediate. People have no faith in us anymore because we're not giving them a number. The problem is we have to look at the clot itself, not the probability. You may have cancer or you may not have cancer. You have an intermediate probability of having a stroke. No one would let me do the head CT like that. So why are we using these RK criteria? That is why we now have something called the Pyoped 2. Remember, the original Pyoped used pulmonary arterial studies, conventional uh, arteriography. We have now got to use more current studies like pulmonary CT angiograms. They began recruiting two, two or three years ago, and we're going to get these newer criteria. Until then, we're still going to use the older Pyoped criteria as well as their modifications simply because we have nothing better. I prefer not to use them. I look at the study and tell them whether the probability of PE is high or not, and that's about it. I would rather use the pulmonary CT angiogram because that way I can actually look at the clot. I don't want to give a probability. I want to tell you whether or not you have a clot in there. Uh, how common is pulmonary embolism? It's approximately between 0.2 and 0.3%. The incidence of pulmonary embolism has not increased over the years. The incidence will not change depending on gender or ethnic differences. The incidence thus will not change whether or not you use pulmonary CT angiograms or a ventilation perfusion scan or a pulmonary catheter angiogram. Be aware that these are the only ways in which you can see the clot. 
using your nuclear medicine technique, you are only inferring whether or not there might be a clot. The, um, the safety is pretty comparable to a pulmonary catheter angiogram versus a pulmonary CT angiogram. However, you're more likely to agree using a pulmonary CT angiogram because you can actually see the clot. Using a pulmonary catheter angiogram, you have to get various oblique approaches, multiple field of imaging, and therefore you are more likely to have disagreements, especially in subsegmental pulmonary arterial filling defects. Uh, the risk of having a suboptimal study is pretty equivalent when you compare a pulmonary arteriogram versus a pulmonary CT arteriogram. So currently, a pulmonary CT angiogram should be your standard of care unless there is a contraindication or you don't have a multiple row detectors CT unit. Uh, let's look briefly at the workup of a DVT and a pulmonary embolism uh, scenario. Uh, D-dimer, this is something that is relatively new, but it is universally used. Remember, D-dimer is very, very sensitive, but it's not specific. If you scrape your knee, you will have a significant D-dimer level. If you're in hospital for anything and, and you undergo multiple tests, you get an IV line, you get blood drawn, your D-dimer level goes up. So D-dimer is good only in the outpatient setting if you haven't had any intervention or invasive procedures. If you are pregnant, you have a physiologic elevation of your D-dimer. So again, not valuable in these settings. It has to be an outpatient, non-pregnant person. If you have a suspicion of deep venous thrombosis and a high D-dimer value, then you've got to judge whether or not you're suspicious of pulmonary thromboembolism. Depending on your pretest probability and your D-dimer level, if your pretest probability is low and your D-dimer level is low, there is no need to get either a lung perfusion scan and or a pulmonary CT angiogram. It's very, very safe. Only one out of over 400 patients did have a small subsegmental pulmonary thromboembolism during follow-up in this large study. So if you have a suspicion and you've got to evaluate for both DVTs and pulmonary uh, arterial thrombi, the quickest way of evaluating is a combination of CT angio and geography of the pulmonary arteries and continue with a CT of the veins in the pelvis and the proximal lower extremities. If you're only looking for deep venous thrombosis, get a sonogram. If you're only looking for pulmonary thromboembolism as we started, get a chest radiograph. Why? The chest radiograph will not rule in or rule out the presence of pulmonary embolism. Remember, the commonest finding is just an atelectatic segment. However, you're looking for hyperaeration. Why is this? If you have hyperaeration or evidence of COPD or chronic lung disease, then there is no point getting a ventilation or lung perfusion scan. You want to jump straight ahead and get a CT angiogram of the pulmonary arteries. Depending on your suspicion of pulmonary artery embolism, if it's low in nature, you can get an isotopic lung study. If your chest x-ray is complicated or if your suspicion is high and you want to define the anatomy, you're going to go ahead and get a, a pulmonary CT angiogram. The sensitivity of the CT scan is much higher when compared with a high probability scan. Remember, very few of your ventilation perfusion scans are actually going to be high probability in nature. Uh, it is also very good for central as well as peripheral pulmonary emboli as compared to your lung perfusion scans. So if you see your clot on your pulmonary CT angiogram, you can treat. If you don't see your clot, then you've got to have your clinical suspicion to help determine whether or not to treat these patients. So does this mean we won't see any ventilation perfusion scans in the future? Not really. We've had the pulmonary CT angiogram in existence for a long time. Many of us are trained to do them, but there has been no significant change in the relative number of ventilation perfusion scans. This is probably because we're more aware of the incidence and prevalence of pulmonary embolism in the current time. Again, lots of complicated protocols. We're not going to go through them. They're in your syllabus. But if you have a high risk factor, you want to go ahead and get a CT angiogram. If you have a low risk factor, you'd rather do a ventilation perfusion scan. If it's inconclusive, then you might want to even get a pulmonary catheter angiogram, which will be definitive in confirming or negating the presence of significant pulmonary embolism. Looking at sentinel node mapping, there are two specific indications for the node map. One is breast cancer for determining how much axillary nodal dissection should be performed, and the other is for 
uh, melanoma. Why can't we use PET scanning? We've told you how wonderful PET scanning is. However, PET scanning is not good enough for initial staging of axillary neoplastic burden. You can have normal-sized lymph nodes with malignancy. So clearly you can't use clinical examination, CT, MR, or sonography. If you have higher sensitivity, then you're not going to be very specific using PET. However, PET is good for looking at the overall staging for local, regional, and distant metastases, not just in the axilla, because axillary nodal metastases are micrometastases. Remember, the resolution of PET is approximately between 8 and 10 millimeters. That is not a microscopic metastatic burden. When you do a whole body PET scan looking for local, regional, or distant metastases, you may incidentally pick up axillary metastases, but this is not the reason why you're doing the PET scan. Axillary nodal evaluation has to be done by the gold standard, which is axillary nodal sampling. Here comes the concept of the sentinel lymph node. The sentinel lymph node is that first lymph node where any material from the quadrant that is affected, whether it's neoplastic, infectious, or inflammatory, will head before it heads to the axilla, which means by extrapolation, if you sample that lymph node, serial sampling, ultra-thin sections, if you don't have tumor in the sentinel lymph node, the axilla is presumed to be free of tumor. You've got to find the sentinel lymph node by injecting the tumor or the tumor bed with small particles that can then be phagocytosed. PET does not work in this way. PET is going to look for hypermetabolic foci, not for the passage of cells. Once you know how many axillary lymph nodes are affected and whether or not they're affected, you will then remove locally affected lymph nodes, as many as possible, depending on where we are going to be localized. This prevents recurrence. This improves staging and it improves planning of adjuvant therapy for uh, breast cancer. Remember, the sentinel lymph node map is valid only if your sentinel lymph node is in the axilla. Often it may be in the ipsilateral or contralateral internal mammary region. This doesn't matter because in these cases, the surgeon will still do a modified dissection of the axillary lymph nodes on the size in which the tumor is. Very unusually, the sentinel lymph nodes may be in the contralateral axilla. We still don't know what the effect of this is and how this can change surgery. So you inject the tumor bed or you inject the area around the tumor if no excisional biopsy has been performed. You acquire images and you want to see the first lymph node that shows uptake of these radiocolloidal particles. This lymph node is going to be removed at the time of surgery. Again, you're going to use an intraoperative gamma probe to see where the counts are coming from. This node is then going to be sectioned immediately, serial sections, which are looked at under the microscope. If this lymph node has tumor, then lymph nodes in that axilla are going to be presumed to have tumor, and they will be removed. If this lymph node does not have tumor, then you do not have to remove extensive axillary lymph nodes at that time. You inject blue dye in the area of the uh, surgery, that is the excisional bed. You massage the area. You also use intraoperative gamma probing. A combination of blue dye injection, your radiocolloid injection, as well as intraoperative gamma probing improves your sensitivity and specificity very, very tremendously. What you're identifying is the time to appear. Remember, it's the first lymph node that appears that is going to be the sentinel lymph node. It's not the brightest or the one with the most counts. It's the first one that appears. You may have more than one sentinel lymph node, up to three at a time. You may have more than one channel that goes to the sentinel lymph node, and you want to evaluate the distribution. It is important surgically only if it is in the ipsilateral or same-sided axilla, not on the opposite side or in the internal maxillary lymph node. Uh, we typically get three views in order to identify the nodes as well as the, the channels that are going into that location. The area over the skin is marked with a Q-tip, so the surgeon knows exactly where to place the gamma probe in order to speed up the procedure, and this reduces intraoperative time as well as anesthetic risk. The projection actually mimics the surgical positions, and therefore you have to get at least three views in order for the surgeon to correlate with how surgery is going to be performed. The skin marking on the surface of the skin directly overlying 
the, the area of the very hot sentinel lymph node in the surgical position is going to be the most important thing determining the site of injection of the, um, the blue dye, which is vital blue dye within the operating theater itself. This is a very sensitive method. If you use a reliable technique and you use this every single time, we're going to take a two minute break and then continue with things under the diaphragm. We're going to talk about the abdomen, pelvis, and the retroperitoneum. We're going to follow this up immediately with the unknown cases, uh, non-pet as well as pet. You're welcome to stay if you have an interest and if you're still awake. Uh, in the abdomen and pelvis, rapid studies, quick studies, very specific studies. Each of them has a CPT code. All the CPT codes are listed in an appendix in your syllabus. We're going to start with the radiocolloid study. Remember, a colloid is a large particle. It is a macromolecule. Anything that takes up colloid is going to show up on a radiocolloid study. It's going to be part of the reticuloendothelial system. Why are we doing this? Typically to look for a hyperplastic focal nodule in the liver or for a spranunculus. Are there any better ways of doing this? Yes. So why are we doing this? Because it has been requested. Sometimes it's faster to do than to argue. Again, when you inject colloidal particles, these are rapidly eaten up by RE cells within the liver, the spleen, and the marrow, which means if you have an area of marrow packing disorder, if you have replacement of liver or splenic parenchyma, you're going to see a photopenic region. This is a sensitive test, but not a very specific test. When exactly would I like to use this? Oftentimes, you get focal fatty metamorphosis within the liver. These patients may be at risk for cancer, or they may have a prior primary tumor, and you're not exactly sure whether or not this is focal fatty change or whether this is indeed a tumor in the liver that needs further workup. Rather than rushing to get a CT or an MRI study or, God forbid, a PET scan, I'm going to get the cheapest study, which is a radiocolloid study. Marrow uptake is always present. All liver lesions except the hyperplastic focal nodule are photopenic. But remember, the hyperplastic focal nodule is really a devil. It has variable appearances. It can be isopenic. It can be isophoton rich. It can be very photon rich, or it can be photopenic. The only use in the year 2004 for the radiocolloid study should be to define fatty change or fatty sparing when the patient is at high risk for having a primary or secondary liver tumor. Again, the hyperplastic focal nodule can look like anything. This is just one of those cases where it is very large and it has significant uptake because it has a larger relative concentration of reticuloendothelial cells, uh, cells than the rest of the liver. Again, the CT appearance is very, very nonspecific. On MR as well, the appearance is nonspecific. It has prompt enhancement in the hepatic arterial dominant phase. It has a central scar that does not promptly enhance. It has rapid washout. On long TR images, it is not ultra bright, which means it is not characteristic of a hemangioma. So if I have a non-cystic, non-hemangiomatous lesion with a central scar, I can do one of two things. I can do a colloidal study. If it is photopenic, I need to needle it. If it is very, very bright, I can leave it alone because it's a hyperplastic focal nodule. Enough about the radiocolloid study. Liverpool studies. Why people do this? It's a mystery to me. We're trying to diagnose hemangiomas. Perhaps your MRI is down. Perhaps you, the patient has a pacemaker or is otherwise terrified to enter the MRI. There is absolutely no reason to do a Liverpool study if you have a functional MRI. It could be a 0.125 Tesla magnet. For God's sake, put the patient in there and just do a rapid study. What we're going to do is we're going to put a patient in a room and insist that this patient not move a limb or breathe for two hours. Hopefully, there will be no misregistration and an area which shows up as a defect on your colloidal study is going to show up on your blood pool study as an area that shows persistent increased accumulation of blood pool, which is autologously labeled red blood cells. Obviously, the quicker way of doing this is by using an MRI, using an ultra-long TR sequence or a Dixon sequence. These hemangiomas are very, very bright. 
using dynamic cinematic sequences. These are T2 star rapid sequence images. We usually image them up to a period of 10 to 12 minutes after rapid injection, circling around that area itself, which is identified in your localizer images. You have to see puddling of contrast in a lobular fashion at the periphery of the lesion with the same time contrast activity curve as the normal aorta. If it does not fill up in 12 to 15 minutes, there is no need to image for two more hours. Go and have lunch. Let the patient have lunch. This is not a hemangioma. It needs to be needled. Biliary excretion studies are typically done at 4 o'clock on Friday evening. What are we looking for? We're looking for cystic duct edema. In order for bile to flow into the gallbladder, you should have a patent cystic duct. If the gallbladder fills up with radiopharmaceutical, the cystic duct is patent. That's all we're concerned about, and this should be achieved by 4.20 p.m. on Friday. If you want to stick around, then don't handle the morphine. Remember, trying to analyze whether they're fasting, how long they've been fasting, giving them orange juice, has no evidence to change anything. Patients in the ICU who haven't been fed for a long time are going to have a significant number of false positive and false negative results. These are all pitfalls of the technique. Typically, in a normal biliary excretion study, you see the liver filling up because this is where the decider, which is an analog uh, very similar to lidocaine, is going to be taken up. There is significant hepatic edge transit time, which is typically between 15 and 20 minutes, which means within 20 minutes, you should see significant incorporation of the decider by the conjugating cells. It's going to be excreted in the bile. It's going to be excreted through the common bile duct, and you should be seeing bowel activity soon enough. If you have a patent cystic duct, there's going to be reflux of radiopharmaceutical into the gallbladder. If you're not sure whether or not that's a gallbladder, get a lateral projection. The gallbladder is typically an anterior structure, though often it may be ectopically located. Biliary to bowel transit is sometimes, however, seen in, in greater than 60 minutes. So there may be delayed hepatic edge transit time. This is a variation of normal. You've got to correlate with the liver function test to determine whether or not you're going to see activity at that time. Typically, if you do not see gallbladder activity at 60 minutes, again, I'm quite impatient, I only wait for 20 minutes, then you want to speed up the study and you want to augment it. How can you do this? You can either get a delayed image, which is hardly augmentation, and you've got to stay till Friday night, or you can give them a touch of morphine, or if it's Thursday, you can bring them back on Friday morning. Typically, morphine augmentation is the best way of speeding up the study, and it's going to give you better visualization. If you see the gallbladder, you have ruled out cholecystitis. If you do not see the gallbladder, you are not sure whether or not there's cholecystitis. Now you have an abdominal surgeon breathing down your neck. Are you going to wait for a few hours? No, you are going to administer morphine. Remember, the dose of morphine is very small. It's homeopathic. This is not going to affect any pain control. You want to give morphine, but immediately, and this is very important, immediately after you give morphine, because chances are 20 to 60 minutes have passed since you give your initial dose of decider. You want to give a touch more of decider, between one and two millicuries of decider, which can be now incorporated by the liver immediately after you give the morphine, and then you image for 30 additional minutes. By this time, you should see a pacification of the gallbladder. If you do not see gallbladder, remember, this is approximately 20 minutes. I see activity within the small bowel. I do not see activity within the liver. If I only gave morphine and I did not give additional decider, there's really not very much to enter the gallbladder. This is very, very logical but poorly understood. I've given morphine and I've given additional decider. This is going to be incorporated within the liver and it should be excreted into the gallbladder. What the morphine does is it contracts the terminus or the sphincter of OD at the end of the common bile duct. Therefore, there is stasis within the common bile duct and it encourages or augments reflux into the gallbladder. So remember, filling of the gallbladder rules out acute cholecystitis. Just because the gallbladder does not fill does not necessarily mean you have acute cholecystitis. There is a host of things that can do this. So only if it fills are you home free. If it does not fill, you could have acute cholecystitis, especially if there is a history of stones or there's a sonographic Murphy sign or other clinical indicators. If you have cellular dysfunction or if you have biliary atresia, typically in 
new bones, you're not going to get conjugation and adequate excretion of radiopharmaceutical to enter the biliary system and or the gallbladder. So it's not a very good study in those patients. Post-surgically, we might be doing the study to analyze for the presence of a bileak. Post-surgically, there may be free infradiaphragmatic fluid. This could just be a seroma or hematoma. You're not sure, but there's deteriorating function, fever, and or abdominal pain. You do it exactly the way you do a native biliary excretion study, and you see a peritoneographic effect. You see that the radiopharmaceutical has been taken up by the liver. It's being excreted, not in the biliary system, but through a leak into the peritoneum. It's outlining loops of small bowel. Looks exactly like a ventricular a tube study. Sometimes you may be fooled because duodenal activity may mimic the gallbladder. It could be longitudinal, and it is, remember, also an anterior structure. In these cases, the trick is orange juice. Give them orange juice, have this propel anteriorly, and you see that there is no visualization of the gallbladder. Sometimes biliary leaks may be mimicked by reflux of radio tracer into the stomach. Again, the trick is very simple. Orange juice, give them something that accelerates activity from the stomach into the small bowel. If it does not push it away, then you know that there is significant residual excreted radiopharmaceutical in the left upper quadrant in the proper clinical setting with free infradiaphragmatic fluid. That is uh, a biliary leak.